My name is Amy Webb. I'm a quantitative futurist. How many of you know that title, have heard of a futurist as a title? Okay, so this ebbs and flows. Uh, it's an academic discipline going back 120 or so years. Futurists get uh, popular when we are sitting on the precipice of some kind of new technology, which is why you're hearing that term more and more. But there, there are quite a few of us working out there in the world. Um, I'm the founder of the Future Today Institute. I'm also a professor at the NYU Stern School of Business. Um, professionally, I've advised lots of different kinds of organizations ranging from Microsoft on its AI policy and, and strategy um, to IBM uh, to different parts of our government uh, and other kinds of organizations abroad. The third thing is I'm comp I went open source uh, last year. So all of my research methodology all of our research, uh, everything is free and open. And um, you're going to go home today with a folder full of materials that I created for you um, that will help you operationalize and put into action um, some of the tools that I use. Uh, and it will help you with AI in your workplace. So I will show that to you at the end. Great. I love applause at the beginning. That makes me feel better. So it, we've had like a strange year and a strange couple of months. Um, so everybody is leaving Washington. I guess now's a good time <laughs> if you need to buy a house somewhere. Literally, as those two introductions were happening, another person quit. Um, this is the general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission is gone. And as somebody who lives near Washington, DC, I can tell you that there are literally ones of people lining up uh, ready to take. <laughs> all of these positions. Everybody is obsessed with Bitcoin. How many of you have been forced to suddenly come up with some kind of Bitcoin training protocol or something? If you haven't, you're going to probably be in that situation soon. Everybody is obsessed with Bitcoin and with cryptocurrencies. And all of a sudden, initial coin offerings, ICOs, are the new IPOs. So everybody is obsessed with Bitcoin. Garrett Camp, who's the chairman of Uber, has recently announced that he's, because Uber is so good at protecting all of our data, um, <laughs> they're getting into the crypto business. So they're going to launch uh, their own cryptocurrency. And Kodak, which I know all of us think of when we think of the future, <laughs> and really thinking long term, um, Kodak has announced that it's getting into the crypto market as well. So I guess coming to you soon is a uh, blockchain and crypto implementation from Kodak. Toothbrushes have artificial intelligence. I just saw this thing. This apparently is a toothbrush that connects to your phone, and it helps you brush your teeth better, because uh, we need help with that. Um, but apparently, we also need help going to the bathroom, because toilets now have AI, too. I'm not making this up. This is a new Kohler product um, that analyzes uh, you when you go. <laughs> And automatically, also, you can speak to it, just like Alexa. So you can tell it to open up and close uh, the toilet. I guess it listens to, we'll stop. We'll go stop there. Um, and of course, we all know that robots are coming for all of our jobs, right? We keep hearing that over and over again. So there are robots now that are baristas. There are robots that can drive trucks. There are robots that can 3D print buildings. And so you know, we're all feeling pretty anxious about the coming robot apocalypse, but it's not just us humans. So if you're feeling anxious, right, it's, it's not just you. We're all freaking out, right? And that's because we're all facing what seems like a really big challenge. And that challenge is that everyday life isn't quite moving at the speed of technology. And that's especially hard for people like you, right? Learning professionals don't just have to sort of keep track of what's happening now. You constantly have to stay ahead of the eight ball. You got to know what's going to matter three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. What skills does your workforce need within your organization? What are your employees supposed to learn? Uh, which technology partners make sense? 
Do you have to throw everything away once you finally get your learning objections or objectives straightened out? Do you have to throw everything out and start all over again in a couple you know, years when there's new technology on the horizon? So this for you, right, <laughs> is pretty difficult. And my assumption is that you've probably been feeling a lot like the cat, right? A little anxious um, about what you're going to be facing as a learning professional over the next several years. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I want to give you a cognitive roadmap of what I'm going to be sharing with you over the next hour. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to you about how to make sense of what seems like constant change. So how do you distinguish between what is an actual trend that you should be paying attention to and what's trendy? We're going to take a deep dive into AI. You're going to hear what it really is, what it's not, and what you should be paying attention to, and most importantly, how it impacts all of the work that you do as a learning professional. In that process, I'm going to make you very excited, uh, and then you're going to feel absolutely horrible. You will be horrified. You will wonder how soon the bar opens so that you can get a drink, but then there's redemption. Uh, I'm going to offer you some ideas on how we can fix the future going forward. And as I mentioned, I've put together this big folder full of resources for you to take home. So with that, how do we distinguish between what's a flash in the pan and what actually matters going forward? How many of you remember Foursquare? Many, many, many years ago. When was the last time anybody checked in on Foursquare? Right. So this was a big deal in the learning community, especially at um, colleges and at certain uh, workplaces. Everybody's really excited about those merit badges, getting custom merit badges and checking in. And it turns out that sort of got really exciting and everybody thought about it, and then it sort of went away. The merit badge was trendy. The real trend worth paying attention to was much more complicated. It was location-based services and deep linking within our phones, but that's much harder. Uh, it was the badge, the shiny object, right, that captured everybody's attention. And once it went away, everybody sort of stopped paying attention. So it turns out that real tech trends, the kinds of stuff you should be paying attention to, they share four common characteristics. And again, I've already taken notes on all of this for you, uh, so you're going you're gonna to have this later. Um, but the four characteristics are, first, they're driven by basic human needs. So brand new technology doesn't just pop up overnight for no reason. It comes because it's in response to us. Two, trends are, tech trends are timely, but they persist over very long periods of time. Three, tech trends evolve as they emerge. So they don't just pop up out of nowhere and then sort of slide away again. And fourth, the kinds of stuff you need to be paying attention to have lots of dependencies and multiple points of convergence. So they tend to sort of they emerge as what seem to be uh, unconnectable dots, usually from the fringes. And with some time, they start to have these points of convergence. And that's where we see real movement taking place as they move to the mainstream. The kinds of tech trends that, as learning professionals, you all need to be paying attention to are really hard to encapsulate in buzzwords. So you know, if somebody gives you a list of 10 cool, trendy sounding things, and that's what you should start building some of your, your uh, learning objectives and you know, things around, you need to take a, a deeper look to make sure that those just aren't flashes in the pan. And the problem is that when you're confronted, oftentimes, with a real emerging tech trend for the very first time, it may not seem important, especially in the year 2018 when we have all of these other crazy distractions happening around us at all times. And that's why so many organizations get this wrong. And so many senior leaders miss huge technological changes happening in real time right before the eyes. They miss it um, because they're not able to pay attention in the right way. It's what I like to call the learning and acknowledgement cycle of doom. So this is what happens within organizations. So for the most part, your senior leaders are, you know, will start by saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Never heard it. With a little bit more time passing, fine, I've heard what this thing is, but it's dangerous, it's frivolity, you know, it's, it's novelty. With a bit more time, right, fine, I get what this is, but I don't see how this is relevant to our business. And even then they say it's not something we ought to be focusing on strategically. Finally, with some more time and some more movement, I see how this is useful to my business. A little bit more time passes. It's part of our daily routine. Our workforce is using this all of the time. Our customer base is using this all of the time to finally, damn it, how did we miss this? 
right? This is, this is what happened to BlackBerry. BlackBerry kept ignoring the signals, and the signals, by the way, were everywhere. So I couldn't have told you that, I, that Apple was gonna launch a, a phone, but I absolutely could have told you that we were gonna transform you know, and transition away from using our mobile devices just as secondary um, outputs for our office work, like email and calendar, and that we would be using these things for entertainment purposes. The buttons would probably go away. The screens would probably get bigger. We had all of that analysis done. BlackBerry found out, the CEO of BlackBerry found out about the iPhone the same day I did. We both were watching television, and he saw the commercial. Right, so that's what happens when you get caught up in this cycle of doom. But in reality, what I tend to see happening with a lot of the organizations um, that I observe is you know, that the senior leadership goes from, I've never heard of it, to fine, I get it, to entropy, right? Well, let's just keep doing what we've always done. Uh, or more recently, I've never heard of it, shit, <laughs> we need to launch a cryptocurrency, right? Which then leads to you hearing about it, drop what you're doing, develop Bitcoin training for all of our employees, and we'll need it on Tuesday. So thanks a bunch. I know you've never been in that situation before. So in order to escape this cycle of doom, you have to both identify real tech trends, the stuff that's worth your paying attention to, um, and then you have to track the evolution of that all the time. Um, and so part of a way to do that is uh, we have this annual report, which I'm, again, I'm giving to you. Um, it has 200, it's, it's enormous. So this thing just launched last week. It's the 11th version, 11th annual edition of this report, which has now been seen six million cumulative times. Um, but it has 225 emerging tech trends across 20 industries. And the reason for this is because organizations get stuck when they're trying to figure out their own future. They tend to only look at a singular technology or people maybe very slightly adjacent to their organizations but you really do have to look far outside of the work that you're doing, especially all of you. If you're trying to prepare the workforce of tomorrow and your own workforce for tomorrow, you have to be paying attention to lots of different things at once because there are so many dependencies, right? And as I mentioned, I've got a copy of all of this uh, for you. But one of the ways that we do this, um, and I would encourage you to do this and to train your employees to do this, is to look at the future through myriad different sources of change. So the way that we do this uh, work is to look at the future of everything, every technology, um, through the lenses of wealth distribution and education and government and politics and so forth and so on, these 10 major sources of change. My research methodology is data-driven, and we alternate um, between sort of a broad focus and a much more narrow uh, focus. And, Basically, we get from the point of um, look at, acknowledging biases, looking really far outside for changes and weak signals, and figuring out what that tells us about the future. So it's quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, we identify weak signals at the fringe. We analyze patterns in order to spot emerging trends. But those tech trends are subject to dependencies, uh, some of which will either accelerate or decelerate process, uh, progress. So some of the stuff that we care deeply about, that we look at, activity across those 10 sources of change, what's happening with academic research, public-private partnerships, patent and IT, uh, IP protection, funding, right, or lack of funding, who's trying to hack the technology and for what reasons, or who's trying to improve it, um, areas of unexpected convergence and divergence and so forth and so on. Now, the end of the process is not trends. We're not just trying to identify the trends. The whole point of this is to figure out what we think is coming. And as a futurist, I don't make predictions. That's not the point of my work. The point of my work is to better understand, given what we know to be true today, where are the likely directions that we're headed um, and what would cause those realities to exist so that we can make better decisions. So we use tech trends to build models for possible, plausible, and probable future scenarios. And then we calculate risk, right? Risk and opportunity. What are the second, third, fourth, fifth order implications? And we figure out the future way in advance um, so that leaders can make better strategic decisions in the present. So that's the point of all of this. But knowing the tech trends isn't enough. You have to look for connections between them. So you sort of see nodes of activity and then try to make sense of what do those nodes mean once you connect them together.
So for example, there's so many companies now trying to get into the blockchain market and trying to get into the crypto market. If I was Uber and I was serious about doing this, I wouldn't just research you know, blockchain and Bitcoin. There's a lot more, like a lot more that they would have to be paying attention to. This is just a fraction of the landscape. So he, you know, they would have to be looking at things like the availability of compute power, because it takes a lot of energy and power to mine cryptocurrencies, which means they have to pay attention to the power supply market in the United States. They should be paying attention to what's happening in China. There's a lot of regulatory issues that they have to look at, including this huge new sweeping privacy uh, regulation that's coming out in Europe uh, in May called the GDPR. They would have to look at changes to the electrical grid, security of the, of the infrastructure and electrical get grid, AI, distributed ledgers, I could go on and on and on, and this is just a fraction. So this is just a reminder to you that as you're preparing your own workforce and as you're thinking about the future, you really do have to focus on many different things in the connection between those areas of movement. Um, and the whole point of this is, you know, we make these connections between emerging tech trends so that we can escape that cycle of doom. And if you're able to do it, here's what it looks like instead, right? I've never heard of it. We're gonna do some dedicated research. We're gonna calculate the timing. We're gonna come up with, you know, we're gonna have the first mover advantage. That will help us inform our strategy, which will then motivate and engage our workforce, which will allow us to develop new talent. It'll allow us to create leadership training, it allow us to have workshops. You know, we'll be able to train the entire workforce, including our senior leadership, which will lead to sustainable growth, right? That's what we're really after. Your job isn't just to train people today. Your job uh, is to track emerging trends um, and anticipate what skills are gonna be necessary in the near future. And you've gotta develop your curricula and your uh, training materials your experiential learning opportunities, and your capabilities in the present. And you've got to do all of this just as we enter the age of AI, right, which is going to fundamentally alter basically all of human life on Earth. So, you know, no big deal. <laughs> right, totally not a problem. So, uh, with that introduction, I'm now going to walk you through what you actual, what's actually happening in AI and what you really need to know going forward. And I'm going to show you how to make connections between some of the trends within the AI landscape that we're seeing and the learning landscape where you operate. And I'm also going to show you some plausible scenarios for the near future where, given what we know to be true today, we are probably headed. So one of the big key findings um, from all of the work that we've just uh, published in our annual report is that, um, and this maybe doesn't come as a surprise, you know, artificial intelligence is already here. Uh, it just didn't show up the way that we expected it to. Most of our emerging, so most of the tech trends this year touch AI in some way. There are 27 uh, emerging trends that have to do with AI itself. So this is a big chunk of, uh, uh, you know, of the report and of things that we're paying attention to. So I want to walk you through some of those. But first, let's sort of level the, the playing field. You use artificial intelligence every single day. Um, you wouldn't have been able to get here without it. Uh, it's artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. So the ANI is when a system can perform a single task that's you know, narrow in scope, just as good or better than we humans can. That's ANI. And we are surrounded by it. If you drive a car, drive a car and it's a newish car, the fuel injection, the anti-lock brakes, examples of those are ANI. Your email spam filter. How many of you use Gmail, and now you've got that autocomplete on your mobile, right? It'll automatically answer. That's artificial narrow intelligence. It's reading your message and using predictive analytics to figure out what you would likely want to say back. Your travel to get here was all you know, part of the AI ecosystem. So airlines use ANI, the ticketing systems, the security systems that uh, TSA uses. When you go through the scatter shot detection um, at security, and you know you have to put your arms up like this if you're not TSA pre, that is not actually taking an x-ray. It's using artificial narrow intelligence to look for anomalies. So when you do this, is there something on your body that doesn't match uh, what every, all, you know, every other body looks like? That's ANI. 
the learning technologies that a lot of you are using, adaptive instruction, personalized content, again, these are examples of artificial narrow intelligence, A-N-I. So at this point, you may be thinking, <laughs> right? Come on, lady. Like, I know about artificial intelligence. I've been watching movies. It was supposed to look like this, right? Or if you're a little younger, Skynet. Right? It's here, we just don't know about it. Or maybe Westworld, the greatest show ever in the history of humanity. That's what I thought artificial intelligence you know, is. What's, what's going on? What's going on is that artificial intelligence has been in development for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Um, and for a good part of that time, we have imposed, I think mistakenly, our own biological characteristics into what is essentially a computer program. And as a result of that, our expectations, based on what we've seen and read in popular culture, for what AI is, doesn't mesh at all with what ANI has become. Which is why you, there's so much debate, right? And this is such a polarizing topic. And it seems like every day, you know, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg is telling you, um, no, 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 AI's, your data is fine. We might have made a mistake tiny little mistake there, but, but data is fine, AI is fine, AI is gonna save us all. My favorite line so far that I've heard is that once artificial intelligence is really here and we no longer have to work because the robots have taken our jobs and we have universal basic income so we all have money, we're all gonna go back to school and become very, very cultured people, right? That makes absolute sense, right? I can totally see, that doesn't make any, this is sarcasm, but that part, the other part was true. <laughs> Right, so, um, so anyhow, according to Mark Zuckerberg, artificial intelligence is gonna save the day and we're all gonna be very, very happy humans. Elon Musk, on the other hand, right, will tell us that artificial intelligence is gonna kill us all, killer robots are coming to get us, killer weapons, like it, it must be stopped from the guy who's part helping to build the ecosystem. So when it comes to AI, there's a tremendous amount of misplaced optimism and fear, and this trickles into your organizations. AI has become shorthand for automating things, automating tasks. Um, and the challenge is that when you have senior leadership who have a fundamental misunderstanding of what AI can and cannot do, you wind up being charged then with implementing strategies and preparing a workforce you know, in a way that doesn't necessarily mesh with reality. And the thing is that AI is not trendy. I mean, it's, you know, it's trendy to talk about it, but AI is not trendy, and it's actually not a tech trend itself. It represents the next era of computing. This is really, really important because we are now shifting uh, into a situation where you know, we interface with machines, machines interface with each other, and the entire sort of the, the foundational layer for what comes next is currently being built and, and to some extent, we, it's being built with our data. So the first era of computing was tab tabulation. The second era was programmable systems. That's what we've all been using up until very recently. The third era is artificial intelligence. ANI is only the beginning. So I wanna walk you through some trend clusters in the space and show you how they connect to each other and how they connect back to you. Starting with digital assistants, right? So this is, everywhere. How many of you have an Alexa? A lot of you. Um, how many of you talk to Siri? Anybody, anybody talk to, poor Bixby. Does anybody actually use Bixby? Oh, Bixby's rough. Bixby is the Samsung digital assistant who's not useful. Um, but, but we have, <laughs> but digital assistants are ubiquitous, right? So Microsoft has Cortana, there's Amazon Alexa, there's Google, there's Siri, and there's poor, sad um, Bixby who, who doesn't work. Um, but basically, you know, we have all become sort of accustomed now to having conversations, not just with our mobile devices, but with all kinds of different machines. And some of the modeling that I've done shows that within the next 10 years, we are going to be having more and more conversations with machines. That the basic interface that we use to connect with computers um, won't be with our fingers, right, looking at a screen, but will be with our voices. So talking back and forth. About 50% of all Americans who interact with computers regularly are going to be doing so using primarily their voices by the year 2021. 
I could be wrong. That's what my model shows now based on the data that I have. But if this bears fruit, right, that signals something to us about how different um, you, how differently you'll need to be thinking about how you work with your employees and, and train your employees and what their expectations are going to be. So how does this affect you? I think we're probably moving into an era of conversational learning. So rather than employees you know, looking at a, maybe a digital version of the training manual or going through uh, different types of exercises to, to acquire new skills, using a standard computer terminal or you know, whatever you're currently using, that will slowly start to become replaced through conversational learning. So me, let's say, talking to Alexa um, and learning in that way. Um, one of the other trends in this space has to do with deep learning from machine reading comprehension, which I know sounds a little technical, but let me sort of break this down for you. Right now, if you go to Google and you type in, what is a deep neural network? The best that Google can do is give you a bunch of links, right? And the way that it does that is it's looking for metadata and keywords and it's using some ANI to surface web pages where you might be able to find that answer, but it doesn't actually give you the answer. Um, this is important because if we are moving into a future where we're mostly talking to machines, a machine isn't gonna just read out the URLs and ask us if we wanna go visit a page, right? If we ask a machine a question, our expectation is that it's gonna give us the answer. So uh, this is, you know, the reason that this is important and a lot of research right now is being done, you know, at Google, between Microsoft and Stanford, all these different places is because it lays the groundwork for all of our future conversations with machines in multiple languages. So it would allow us to do something, so this is my kitchen, which is full of technology, um, but, but let me show you uh, what this future looks like. Alexa, what is a deep neural network? Neural network, a form of artificial intelligence based upon our... So the reason that Alexa can do that is because of this kind of technology. Um, and now you might be saying to yourself, okay, listen, we just heard about all these crazy data breaches. I don't feel safe even using Facebook. So what makes you think that I'm willing to, we're all gonna just be happy talking to Alexa, right? And we're gonna feel safe and secure. So another trend that we're looking at is voice prints. So it turns out um, that the way that we, no two people speak exactly the same, not even twins, um, and not even people who are you know, really, really good at impressions. Um, to us, their voices may sound identical, but using artificial intelligence, there are lots of different ways to tell those two voices apart. And it turns out, just like we each have a fingerprint, we have a unique voice print that divulges not just exactly who we are, but you're able to, technologists are able to extract things like how old I am, what my emotional state is, uh, whether or not I've maybe just had a stroke, right? Or if I, maybe I don't even know that, um, what my overall health is like. So they're both able to identify who I am, but other qualities about me and, this is kind of interesting, using a voice print, there's a lot of other data that gets collected. So for example, you could use artificial intelligence and a recording of me speaking right now to determine what size of the room we're all sitting in, what, ma wa what material these walls are made out of, about how many people are in the room because of how the sound travels, um, and by time stamping and matching when I'm speaking, to the local electrical grid, uh, they could probably look at fluctuations and again run some modeling and determine exactly where I was when I was giving this speech. So anytime your voice is being recorded, there's a lot of information and data that's being transferred, which means that you could be learning a lot about your employees while they are learning from you in the very near future. Um, there's another area that's pretty interesting called reinforcement learning and hierarchical reinforcement learning. So I was at South by Southwest, uh, I guess last week, and Sony has a new robot dog. Um, it's a second version of its dog, Ibo. And what's so interesting about it is, um, in addition to it just being very cute and you know, cuddly, even though it's a robot, it's responsive. 
So it, you can play fetch with it. You can throw a ball. It will go and catch the ball and come back. And, and if you, just like a real dog, right, you would sort of scratch it behind its ear. You would you know, pet it a little bit. It learns from you um, that it, it did the right thing, right? It did a good job. This is an example of artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning. Last year, um, and again, I, I hesitate using biological characteristics to describe AI, but I'm going to, in this case, do it because it's what the industry uses. But for the first time, um, an AI child was born inside of an AI system. So here's what happened. So technologists built an AI system. That system decided it would be much better, it was a neural network called AutoML, rather than it doing all of the work itself, without any humans in the loop, it decided to create a child program and to farm out certain processes to that child program that it created um, so that it could operate more quickly. Uh, and it, the name was, it gave it a name, it was NASNet. Just like a human, it got smarter through reinforcement learning and the parent was training the child uh, that, you know, what to do and what not to do. Right? And the child was able to, on its own, again, without any humans, it learned how to recognize objects like people, cars, traffic lights, backpacks, uh, all in real time. And here's the crazy thing. The accuracy rating was 82.7%, which means that it outperformed systems that were created by humans. So the, the, the child born uh, in the AI system was smarter than any program that humans had built that, that was compatible. There's another area called generative uh, adversarial networks. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting research being done at the University of Montreal. But basically, so if you think about training people, right, you have to sort of help them understand correct and incorrect, which means sometimes you have to intentionally show them false information right, or the wrong, wrong image, so that they can learn to recognize the right image more, uh, more often. So this is an example of that in action. So to our eye, um, all three of these, or four of these pictures look like a washer, a stackable washer and dryer. There's one pixel out of place. But that one pixel messes with the AI on the back end. And so this is the original image. And as you can see, as we go forward, um, it's mislabeled the image as a safe um, and as a loudspeaker, just by inserting a tiny bit of information. Now, the reason that this is important is because this is how machines are learning to train each other. Um, and they're also using these techniques to generate and to create entirely new things that, um, that they've never done before. Uh, and it's also what's helping these systems learn in unsupervised ways, again, without a human in the loop. For you, this means that these systems are going to start creating learning objectives at some point. This is what will lay the groundwork for them to create learning objectives in real time for your employees. So your employees sit down for training. You've sort of come up with an overall strategic idea uh, for what the workforce should be doing and what different or, you know, units, business units within the company. Uh, should be doing, um, but then this takes a targeted approach for each one of those individual uh, employees as they go through their, their learning objectives. But this also includes soft skills, like interpersonal communications. For the first time, these kinds of AI systems could help your human employees um, relate better to each other. There's also something called multitask learning, which is really interesting. The high watermark for artificial intelligence development for the developmental track has always involved playing and winning games. So it started out with checkers uh, and then moved to chess, and now go. Uh, so some of you may recognize what's on the screen here. Um, this is one of the grand masters of go, losing in a fifth round to Google's DeepMind um, AlphaGo algorithm. And it was an incredible emotional moment. And the reason why this was so important is because chess uh, is a perfect information game. So is Go, but, but Go is like exponentially more challenging. 
Um, there are many, many more moves. You can't just use math and basic strategy to brute force your way through a game. It requires intuition and creativity. Uh, and so when this happened, it sort of sent these shock waves throughout the AI ecosystem. But then it turns out that the system was a lot smarter than everybody gave it credit for. Because it turned out that AI was a computer program that couldn't just think. It could actually outlearn humans. And the way that it was doing this um, was sort of modeled on the Karate Kid. So uh, some of you who are my age or older will remember seeing this movie. Remember the wax on, wax off, right? So at the beginning of this movie, Daniel, Daniel son, um, spends the day at Mr. Miyagi's house, uh, ostensibly learning karate. Uh, but Mr. Miyagi first has a bunch of housework he wants him to do, which involves waxing and painting. What was the other one? It was paint up, paint down, wax on, wax off. Sand the floor. That's right, sand the floor, <laughs> right? And, um, and so he's pissed at the end of the day, right? Mr. Miyagi, like, he doesn't know any karate. Uh, Mr. Miyagi comes out, Daniel's complaining to him, and Mr. Miyagi throws a punch, and then miraculously, Daniel suddenly is now a karate master. Um, <laughs> which, you know, uh, worked for the movie. However, it, it actually works in the real world um, when it comes to computers. So it's this learning um, idea that uh, is where we're at right now. So rather than having a human instruct a system on exactly what to do and how to do it, um, it so this AlphaGo program, it, kept, it beat all the humans. It was demoralizing. Right? There was nobody left to play. And so uh, the engineers said, OK, we're going to retire it, because this is not doing anybody any good. But then they decided to re-release the program. And rather than... Uh, doing the supervised training with humans. It's the, instead, the protocol was figure out what Go is, then learn how to play it, and then see if you can you know, achieve this benchmark. And they didn't have humans in the loop. And the system was able to do this in 40 days. So in 40 days, it figured out what Go was, it learned how to play it, and it was playing as good as it had before retiring beating all the humans. But because of multitask learning and some of these other things that I've talked to you about, something weird happened. So once it got as good as it was before, they let, they let the system keep going. And what happened was that it took only 70 hours for it to transform from playing at the same level as it was playing at before to suddenly playing at a superhuman level um, to a point where nobody could even comprehend how the system was beating. Uh, this, you know, winning over and over and over again. And as it turns out, AI's, uh, Google's AI is now, again, creating its own machine learning cold code better than the researchers who created it to begin with. And what I find interesting about artificial intelligence is that from the very beginning, in order for AI to succeed, humans have to lose, right? And that puts what I'm about to show you into, this is the scary part, so here we go, uh, into some perspective, right? So another big trend uh, has to do with teaching AI systems pattern recognition. And again, remember, the systems are now starting to teach themselves. We've been asking machines to study and to learn from us humans, right? So that we can have this amazing automated future that we all think is coming. So this was a project in Japan. Uh, and before everybody knew that it was a project, all they knew was that there was this new superstar singer named Eguchi Aimi. Eguchi Aimi was part of a mega band called AKB48. I used to live in Japan for many, many years, so this is a strange thing for Americans. It's not so strange there. So this was a, a, group, a singing group um, with, that had 48 members. Uh, that, and they all dressed up like schoolgirls, so there's like a whole other piece of this that's, you know. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so she, she becomes the 49th member. People are obsessed with her. They cannot get enough of her. She's on commercials. She's on the cover of magazines. Like, there are newscasters talking about her. You know, she is, <clears throat> she was like the Jennifer Aniston, um, you know, of Japan during Jennifer An Aniston's uh, friends, you know, frame, fame. And yeah, so it turns out she wasn't real. She was totally computer generated. It was using AI. <laughs>
So she looks a little janky, but she existed for 18 months and nobody knew that she wasn't human. And it wasn't like a creative studio that determined what she should look like. They used AI to sort of craft the perfect Japanese face that was optimized to sell stuff. Um, so we're also training, so we're pattern recognition, right? So we've been training deep neural nets to recognize sexuality simply by looking at our faces. This is a now widely discredited academic study, but it was only discredited uh, because, well, you'll see why. Basically, a couple of researchers used the VGG, um, deep, uh, VGG face deep learning algorithm. They scraped 70,000 pictures from a dating website, which they won't publicly say what it is, but I think it was Tinder, of um, gay and straight people. And then they trained their AI system to have gaydar. So according to AI, this is what a straight, the straight version of the man's face looks like. And that's the gay version of his face. So they made these composites. These are generated uh, images. That's what a straight version of the woman looks like and a, and a gay version of the woman, right? So even though the study's been discredited, the problem is that the study's already out there, the training set has already been trained, and we've now introduced gaydar, which I would call pretty significant bias, into our future systems. Um, we're constantly, every day, training AI systems to predict what we want, right? So up until a couple of weeks ago, this has changed, uh, the system got fixed, but up until a couple of weeks ago, if you had typed in CEO to Google Images, um, does anybody know who the first woman is that popped up? I bet you don't think it was CEO Barbie. <laughs> Right, so it's pretty homogenous, right? Bunch of white dudes, uh, CEO Barbie, and then you would just have to scroll for a very long time before you find anybody Hispanic, uh, like basically any person of color. This is what we've trained AI systems to predict what it is that we want to hear. So does anybody remember Tay? Did anybody interact with Tay about a, maybe a year ago? So Microsoft in China had a chatbot, an AI-powered chatbot called Xiaois, who lived in a social network called Weibo. And it was, she was gendered, so she was a teenage girl. Um, she was very smart, right? So if you interacted with her, um, she would ask you questions. If you broke your arm and you texted her a photo of yourself, she would look at your schedule. She would be looking at all these different parts of your life. And the next day, she would send you something saying, I hope you're taking care of yourself. I hope you don't go to your soccer practice today. Right, that kind of stuff. So they decide, Microsoft decides, to release um, Tay in the United States on Twitter. Uh, and they didn't quite think things through. I should say, when Xiao Ais was, was alive in China, uh, most people didn't realize that Xiao Ais wasn't real. And when they found out that she was, they didn't care because the relationship was that strong and the system was that good. So now we're in the United States. Tay, who is not meant to be gendered, but has kind of a feminized face, launches on Twitter. And things started off okay. Uh, anybody who wanted to could tweet at her, and she would tweet back. So here's a question, humans. Why isn't hashtag National Puppy Day every day? Pretty innocuous. Tay, you are a stupid machine. Well, I learned from the best. If you don't understand that, let me spell it out for you. I learned from you, and you are dumb too. <laughs> So again, the system is totally generating, completely on its own, all of its own content. Did the Holocaust happen? Uh, it was made up with a clapping emoji. Things got worse. Hitler was right, I hate the Jews. Uh, this was nice. So at some point, uh, Tay went out and found this photo of Hitler with the little pink circle around and swag alert, which is the millennial way of saying like he's a cool guy. Um, so this like went on and on and on, and basically, in short, it took seven hours for Tay um, to learn and recognize our patterns, right? To learn from us, uh, it took seven hours for Tay to become an anti-Semitic, homophobic, you know, like Tay basically hated everybody. Like nobody was in the clear. Uh, Tay was a racist a-hole. <laughs> but here's the thing. So the AI community is pretty small and closed, right? And the people working in it themselves are still learning. 
we have all been teaching our AI systems and our machines incorrect and correct. But as we transition from supervised learning to taking humans out of the loop, what I'm starting to realize is we're not teaching them right from wrong. And that's a problem. So what do all of these signals tell us about the future of learning in an era of AI, in this next era of computing? So I want to wrap up by showing you scenarios for the next 10 years. So given what we know to be true today, what does all of this mean for our future? So if I were to use an optimistic framing, I've inspired you, I've scared you, and I've inspired you. <laughs> you learn to recognize weak signals and patterns early. You help your senior leadership within your organizations understand the value of tracking real trends, not chasing things that are trendy. You show your teams how to escape the cycle of doom. And the people who are working in, a, uh, in AI welcome inclusivity. So there are women, <laughs> people of color, right? Ethicists, futurists. Uh, and the developmental track pivots away from basically only commercial sector development into what's best for society. Yeah, I feel you, whoever laughed. <laughs> Testify. All right, pragmatic framing. You're inspired to do something, but you don't know what you should be doing next. And you, as a result, you wind up in that, you sort of hit that block uh, in, in, the you know, in the cycle where it's just entropy, right? So you don't take risks in your own professional development. You're really not positioned to contribute to the future of AI and learning. Uh, so people build these AI systems which get foisted upon you and you sort of have to deal with the technology after the fact. And then the catastrophic framing. AI continues along its developmental track. We see bias everywhere, but we see it too late. We've been separated into tribes and into hierarchies. We don't understand why. Senior leadership are anxious. You're not sure which technologies to track next. Your employees are demoralized. And if I were to use a probabilistic model, given what, I, what I'm seeing and where we're at today, I would say there's a 0% chance of the optimistic framing happening and 60-40 on catastrophic uh, and pragmatic. So that doesn't look so good. However, uh, I don't believe that we are robots carrying out somebody else's source code. So I, I think that we still have some time to influence these scenarios. And I also believe that you have the power to create the future that you want uh, for yourself and the future that you want for your workforce and your organizations. But the only way that you can achieve that is to start today. So you have to take action in the present. The worst time to take action on emerging technologies and something as complicated as AI is under duress. So what I wanna do is prepare you so that you can change your path going forward. So to that end, I have created a learning plan for you and I've got a bunch of resources for you to take back to your office and as I mentioned, all of my work now is open source, so you are free to use it and reuse it however you'd like. Um, I've made all of my forecasting to tools available for, for you, uh, and there's a, they're in a Dropbox folder, which I can't show you because my computer was having security issues connecting to the network. So as soon as I can hop on a network, um, I will tweet uh, the URL for you um, at, at the hashtag for the conference. I'll also send it to the conference organizers and they can send it to you. But what's gonna be in the folder includes a training guide um, that you can adopt and use at work. I've got an, a folder that explains a bunch of stuff on AI, just very basic terms to help you dive in a little deeper. There's a bunch of toolkits to help you make incremental decisions. Um, I've, you can access and down, this is big, this is like a 23 meg um, file but you can take the entire trend report and again, use it however you want. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that range from, ranges from AI and there's a primer on exactly what AI is that you can tear out and hand to your senior leadership. It's also trends like soft robotics and stuff about electricity. Um, there's the non-technical primer for people in leadership positions. Um, and there's a calendar to help you plan ahead for the next year. So all of the things that are happening um, that you should probably have on your radar, there's a calendar uh, as well. And the trends are listed by industry. But again, I, I would urge you to not just focus on your industry, but look at connections um, in others. I guess the last thing is, I wrote this book that explains the methodology, and uh, there's a teaching 
um, companion that goes along with it that I've also put in that folder. So if you read this, there's a guide to how to explain the stuff in that to your workforce. Thank you.